thank you much, uh, Pascal and the organizers for, for having me uh, speak at this conference. Um, I'm sorry not to be able to come in person. We don't really have anything like the Alps here in Kansas, but I will be talking about uh, montane plants at least, although from the opposite side of the world. And I guess I'm going to focus on methods a bit, given that might be the, the broadest interest uh, to this audience, and specifically techniques to measure natural selection at the whole genome scale. And historically, this has been done primarily with molecular population genetic methods and tests, where you look for the historical signature of selection in patterns of variation. And what I want to talk about today are kind of um, methods for, for using genomic data in contemporary studies of selection, ongoing selection. And I'll contrast kind of two major methodologies for doing that, um, which differ in kind of the detail of the experimental method. The first of these studies will look at a transplant of fully genome sequenced individuals into natural populations, and then we subsequently follow individuals through their lives and measure traits and fitness. And consider that in relation to a second methodology where we start with the natural population itself and genotype plants in situ, native plants, and then follow them through their lifetimes uh, to measure traits and fitness. And then finally, how we can use the more classical technique of intensive sequencing of populations, both through time and across space, to measure allele frequency changes with a specific view to how it can corroborate results from the, the first two methods. So uh, my interest in this is, is variable, but we could organize a, a lot of the work around three questions. And uh, the kind of long-term interest of my lab is, is what maintains genetic variation within natural populations, which is a, a very broad question. I, I would say um, my interest is mostly in quantitative trait variation and particularly things that relate to lifetime reproductive success. The second question is, can we predict allele frequency change uh, at SNPs across the genome? from measurements of fitness or from environmental variables that drive natural selection. In other words, to what extent can we do in population genetics what is in fact common in quantitative genetics? And finally, uh, I'm interested in what is the genomic extent of natural selection on ecological timescales? How much of the genome is under selection of an intensity that we can actually measure it when we look at the scale of one to 10 generations, as opposed to tens of thousands of generations. So this um, is a picture of, of the uh, population I'll talk primarily about at Iron Mountain, which is in the Cascade Mountains of, of Oregon in the Pacific Northwest of, of um, America. And the tiny little yellow dots you should see down here are plants in flower, okay? So these are not trees. Uh, an adult monkey flower in this population will be about five centimeters in height. And across this population, which spans a, a decent amount of the slope, a good year will have 500,000 individuals flowering and reproducing. So it's a large population, but it experiences fairly dramatic um, environmental experiences or pressures over the span of a single generation. Um, it has a short growing season. And in May and June, the, the site is covered with snow that clears um, with kind of increasing temperature. And you'll get a bolt and progression to flowering over the next few weeks uh, with the plants subsisting mainly on snow melt. And by mid to late July, everybody's dying of drought because they're, you know, basically when the snow melt goes away, um, there isn't water supplied by rain or anything like that here. And so death by desiccation is the, the primary cause of mortality, um, except for the occasional elk trampling through the, the site. Um, but the timing of these events, how much time there is, say, between snow clearance and everybody dying of desiccation, that varies a great deal from one year to the next. So the first of these methods um, was a, a, a transplant study, what I'll call a field uh, genome-wide association study. And the lead author uh, was Ashley Droth, who's pictured to the upper right here. That's the only picture I have of Ashley. Um, and the method here is, is we start with the 
um, a characterized population in the greenhouse. We had been doing work on this population or have been now for over 30 years. And so we had formed a large collection of homozygous uh, lines that are typical of the population or extracted from the population. And we fully genome sequenced those and then intercrossed them to produce thousands of plants with known genotype. And those are the actual plants that are under study in the field population. Uh, they're transplanted out as seedlings to match the native vegetation and kind of age and stage. And then we monitor them subsequently for the development of traits and for fitness components. So in this kind of study, what's important about it, of course, common gardens are, are very common in, um, in tree research and all kinds of organisms. One feature which is relevant here, of course, is that the common garden is the natural population and the experimental plants, which we're going to be measuring natural selection on, they kind of match the background population in terms of allele frequencies at SNPs across the genome. Now, the traits we measured were kind of driven by past research, but key ones are the rate of maturation. How many days does it take to reach flower? And if you do reach flower, what is flower size and associated reproductive capacity? And we link that to measurements of fitness, such as whether you survive, in some sense, this is whether you make it to flower before dying of desiccation. And if you do, what is the total seed set of plants that make it to flower? And we do the standard kind of GWAS methodology here um, where we test every SNP in the genome after controlling for genetic background and so forth for effects on each trait and each fitness component. And we deduce a, a set of highly significant SNPs, which I'll show you some results for these 45 that passed um, the kind of most stringent thresholds, as well as a larger collection of SNPs that pass a less stringent threshold, the p-value less than 10 to the negative five, admitting that this might include some false positives. And a lot of the results from this field study or collection of field studies were organized um, around previous work, quantitative genetic work, um, looking at a particular trade-off, which seems to be important in this population. And in fact, this species um, uh, complex more generally. Um, what I'm depicting here are uh, multi-locus genotypes and how they vary in the rate of progression to flowering. We have plants that are relatively fast and those that are relatively slow. Now our relatively slow plants are still reaching flower within 35 days in the greenhouse, but that's much slower than the, the fast ones, which only take 21 days under greenhouse conditions. And what we can see is that there's a lot of genetic variation for rate of progression to flowering, but that is pleiotropically related to your reproductive capacity if you do reach flowering. The plants that delay flowering tend to be much bigger plants when they flower and have more pollen and more ovules and thus greater capacity for reproductive success. And the first kind of result of the GWAS study was that we can find at the scale of individual SNPs what we had observed previously with quantitative genetic measures. And that's that if you look at these highly significant SNPs and ask what is their effect on how fast a plant matures, in other words, what is the rate of progression to flowering, which is on the x-axis, we see a strong relationship between the effects of the, the, the SNP on this particular trait, days to flower, and also on basically size if you do flower. In other words, flower size for uh, PC1 or plant height. This positive relationship um, is what we had observed at the quantitative genetic uh, level. And that Q1 in the upper right-hand part of the screen is to remind me to relate this back to the questions I outlined. Um, and my first question is what maintains genetic variation in the population? And this result corresponds to something called antagonistic pleiotropy. In other words, an allele, which is good in one sense, it allows you to develop fast and thus perhaps flower at all before you uh, die of drought, uh, seems to be negatively associated with another trait, which is your reproductive capacity if you reach flower. The second result from the GWAS is that if we look at allele frequencies, and of course, this is one of the things that comes out of an association study, not only the effects of alternative alleles, but their relative abundance in the population, we almost invariably see that the big slow allele is less common than the small fast allele. 
And what we're depicting here is my, you know, the effect of the minor allele on the trait. And you can just see that most of those effects are positive on the traits like flower size and height, but their frequency is substantially less than 0.5 among these highly significant SNPs. And the result, which again is critical to field work, we can estimate a lot of traits in the greenhouse, but we can't really estimate fitness, is depicted in this rather complicated graph. What you have across the top is results from 2014 versus 2016, which is across the bottom. The columns represent two different fitness components. Viability is on the left, so that's A and C. Total fitness, which includes viability, is on the right. And what we've plotted here is all the SNPs which have um, it, you know, kind of the lower significance threshold and how they affect flower size. And what you can see is in 2014, there was selection against the large flowered alleles at all of these particular SNPs or across the large collection of SNPs. In other words, those regressions are negative, but we see a reversal in 2016. And so alleles that delayed flowering, but produced a larger flower when they progressed to flowering, that's under positive selection in 2016. And this reversal in the direction of selection is consistent with the environmental differences between these two years. In 2014, it was kind of a standard year where a lot of the plants never make it to flower at all. Whereas 2016 was a high water year, maybe a more snowpack, the growing season was extended, a much larger fraction of plants made it to flower, and that might have provided kind of the advantage necessary for the slow genotypes to progress and exploit the advantage of having higher reproductive success. And again, this goes to question one that I outlined at the beginning, which is factors that maintain variation in a population. And, and one potential mechanism to have alleles that persist despite strong selection is that that selection varies temporarily from one generation to the next. Now, the second kind of methodology that I want to talk about kind of was we were doing both of these sorts of experiments simultaneously. And this is where you don't start with sequence lines. You just go out to the natural population and sample it at the earliest stage possible. Now, thankfully for me, Juan already introduced in the first session the selection component method with respect to studies of viability. Here we're doing that just as a, a methodology for measuring selection genome-wide from this kind of observational approach. And I've depicted here a population of monkey flowers at the seedling stage. And if we were to collect DNA from all of these, we'd obtain an initial allele frequency at any one SNP. Now, as a population geneticist, I refer to this as the zygote allele frequency. But in truth, it's the frequency among seedlings before the first episode of selection. We will have populations as we or as we move forward through time, we will have them advance and some of them will make it to flower and some of them won't. That immediately partitions this entire collection of individuals into two cohorts. And that's the terminology of selection component models. We have the group that fail to make it to flower and those that survive. And that gives you two allele frequencies to compare. The allele frequency, say, of the reference base among the survivors versus among the dead. In this case, the dead don't really die any earlier than the survivors, they just don't make it to flower. And the simplest sort of calculation allows you to predict the change in allele frequency within the whole population through a contrast of allele frequencies between the survivors and the dead. And this is one of the analyses, of course, we are doing here. Here's an illustration of that, not for the Iron Mountain population, but for another population that's close by, what we call the quarry population. And the null hypothesis in this test is that there's simply no genetic differentiation between the individuals that survive and those that do not. And so the null hypothesis is that these two allele frequencies are the same. I have a depiction of the results to the right here with a color coding of SNPs that are significant. In other words, we reject the null versus those that are not. And what you can see in this case is that the red points, the significant ones, show a greater magnitude of delta P change in allele frequency than the non-significant. This is, of course, perfectly uh, consistent with intuition. This graph illustrates one sort of conclusion one can draw from this kind of study. I'm plotting the delta P versus the initial frequency of the reference base, what it was pre-selection. And what you can see is that we have an abundance of points to the upper right 
in the lower left. And what that means is that when we see viability selection in this population, in this particular year, there was a clear tendency for it to favor the more common base in the population. Okay, so it's pushing the more common base towards fixation. So with these kind of selection component analyses, all right, we can measure multiple components of selection. That's why they're called selection component analyses. And the second component I wanna talk about is something that I call male selection. And it's obtained by first focusing on all the survivors, collecting up all of their seeds and genotyping a subset of those seeds. And if we've genotyped all the maternal plants, in this case, I should mention that my plants are hermaphrodites, so everybody's both a mom and potentially a dad, and determine that she has genotype AA, and then we genotype a subset of her progeny, we can infer what dad gave to the progeny. Now, this is like a paternity analysis, except we don't have to actually witness paternity. You can do paternity analysis when you genotype a large fraction of the individuals in a population. But even though my study has thousands of individuals, that's a tenth of 1% of the total population size. So we have to kind of infer selection through differential male success without actually observing differential male access by identifying dads. And you can see in this case, we're attempting to infer what dad gave to each offspring just by looking at the offspring genotype and contrasting it to the maternal genotype. That is a very simple part of what is actually a more elaborate likelihood calculation, but as an act of charity, I'm not showing the math. So this component of selection, which I'll call male selection, it's done in the observational study, but we didn't actually do it uh, in the field GWAS, so we'll have a contrast of results there. Here is the equation for change in allele frequency owing to male selection. And P sub S is the frequency of a base among all successful male gametes, those that sire offspring, versus P sub A, which is all adults. You can think of that as all potential males. And the null hypothesis, of course, is that there's no male selection. P sub S is equal to P sub A, and there's no change. So what causes male selection? Well, it could be exactly what you think, just differential success of diploid males. And that might be because selection through male function is different than through female function, or it could be that they're the same. But the second option is even if all males are equally successful in the population, this component of selection will absorb pollen competition, haploid level selection. Um, and so we can't really distinguish them from this. It's an aggregate measure of those two components, differential success of diploid males and any subsequent pollen competition or even meiotic drive. So here's a design of the experiment we did at our focal population uh, at Iron Mountain. And in the first year of study, 2013, um, we had just adults and the male selection component. But in the subsequent year, we did both viability selection and subsequent reproductive success. And our first issue with this was to address kind of question two I out outlined at the beginning. And that is, can we take measures of selection in one generation and actually predict change into the next generation? So. We looked at all the genes in the genome and picked out the single most significant SNP within each gene and then culled it to that set of genes, which had reasonably strong evidence for at least one SNP under male selection. That establishes the prediction, which is on the x-axis of this graph. In other words, how much change should occur based on what we saw in the year 2013. And then we went out the next year and genotyped large cohorts of plants from the same population. And that establishes the vertical axis here, which is the observed change in allele frequency into the next year. And what you can see is that there does seem to be a positive relationship between the prediction of change and the observation of change, which was kind of the intention of the study, was to determine if we can use observations of selection to predict change through time. And this is a single evolutionary step, but you take multiple steps by first taking a single step. Now, a lot of the paper which occurred, or, or which kind of was, uh, I guess, appeared in PLOS Genetics earlier this year, is about attempting to corroborate and explore this prediction in some depth to determine if it's real and defensible. If it is real, 
it, how perfect is it? Do we tend to under or overestimate the response in terms of allele frequency? And I'm not going to go into any of that detail. I'll be very happy to ask or, or address questions about it. Um, one of the methods we used, of course, for evaluating the prediction was cross-validation, where we take half the data set to make the prediction and split it into a second half in which we'd use it entirely to kind of evaluate the prediction. And that's what's happening to the right. This was a number of analyses which we did in an attempt to uh, verify that we at least have positive prediction. And most of these, I think, are fairly encouraging for the use of population genetic models, selection component models, to do prospective forward time prediction. But of course, that was only the first part of the study. The second part of the study was to look in that second year, 2014, and measure selection again. And in this case, we measured both viability selection and male selection. And what we saw first was temporal fluctuations in selection at individual SNPs between these two years. The first uh, observation was that viability selection was actually quite important in this second year, um, although not quite as strong as male selection was in the previous year. But male selection was much weaker in 2014 than 2013. And this will prove an, an important theme when we synthesize different data sets. The second thing, and this is true of both the GWAS and this study, and it goes to the third question that I outlined. When we just zoom out and look across the genome, we actually have fairly extensive evidence for selection, not at one or two major loci, but at hundreds of SNPs across the genome, and they're well dispersed over chromosomes. So what you have is a depiction of the chromosomes on the x-axis and the little dots represent SNPs of various levels of significance for different components of selection. And I included this because as a genomics talk, you definitely need plots with an incomprehensibly large number of small dots. The real takeaway here is that the dots are dispersed kind of all the way across left to right. Although you can see, for example, if you look at male selection in 2013, you have a lot more colored dots than you do in 2014. That was, of course, question three at the beginning. What is the genomic extent of selection? Now, the other thing we'd like to do to go back to our question about the maintenance of polymorphism is consider some of the questions we looked at earlier by contrasting different components of selection between the year 2013 and 2014. And first, look at the upper left-hand panel. This is where we're looking at the relationship between SNPs that were under male selection here in 2013, that's what's on the x-axis, and plot that against the predicted change for those same SNPs in 2014 under viability selection. And what the negative relationship indicates here is that if a SNP was favored by male selection in 2013, it tended to be disfavored by viability selection in the following year, 2014. Again, an indicator of antagonistic pleiotropy. An allele which is good in one context seems to be bad in another. In contrast, if we compare male selection in 2013 to male selection in 2014, which is this lower left-hand panel here, you can see that there's a generally positive relationship. Male selection was weaker in 2014, but if we just look at the direction of change, there was a good deal of consistency in direction for this one component across these two years. And the final bit here is this lower right-hand panel. There does seem to be a negative relationship within 2014 between male selection and viability selection. To some extent, this is applied, implied by the previous two panels. And I've also kind of dark shaded it because there's a statistical issue here because the estimates for the Y and the X are not fully independent, not based on completely distinct data as they are on the panels to the left. But still, in aggregate, this suggests a bit of a trade-off between different fitness components. So to summarize this part of the talk or the second study, hundreds of SNPs seem to experience male selection in 2013 with one allele uh, that was favored. Um, one allele was at elevated frequency of unsuccessful male gametes relative to the entire population of adults. And in 2014, Allele frequencies at these SNPs consistently shifted in the predicted direction, which is the results you'd like to see if, if you want to use a population genetic model for forward time prediction. 
We also saw evidence for antagonistic pleiotropy and fluctuating selection, which were also observed in the transplant study, the GWAS experiment. So what I wanna to touch on briefly here is kind of the third part is how do we take kind of more classical sort of data and integrate it with these individual based studies in the field. And what I'm pointing to here is kind of intensive population sequencing um, to measure allele frequency differences or changes. And these can be done either through time or across space. And of course, across space is the standard molecular ecology experiment where you go out and sample a population in different regions and look at allele frequency divergence. Now in the GWAS study, I talked about this apparent trade-off between speed and size, and we'd like to ask ourselves if that sort of trade-off, which we observe in Iron Mountain, manifests when we compare different populations. And in this case, we're gonna compare populations like the Iron Mountain population, which overall is quite small and fast, to other populations of monkey flower, which grow in, in more permissive environments where the plants can get much bigger. In this case, we're gonna contrast Iron Mountain to a population which is only about 6.5 kilometers away, uh, the quarry population. I showed you one graph from quarry earlier, but the key thing with quarry is be snow clears earlier and the, and the season is a bit longer. And so plants have kind of more time at quarry to flower and reproduce. There is a moderate around amount of genetic divergence genome wide between these two populations. If you do a pairwise FST, it's at about 0 0.13. And here's the key result relating population sequencing to estimated effects within populations. And what I'm depicting here in this graph is on the x-axis here, and my own thing is getting in the way. <laughs> All right, we have a zoom failure. Um, I think what I have, I can't actually see it on my screen, uh, is for each of the SNPs which had an apparent effect on at least one trait, in the field GWAS, how did you affect flower size? Okay, and we can see there's a lot of variation in the effect of individual SNPs on flower size. And then let's look at allele frequency between the larger flowered quarry population and the smaller flowered IM population. And what you can see is if you look around the zero point, there's a lot of SNPs where there's fairly minimal divergence in allele frequency between the two populations. All right, they're connected by gene flow. Maybe that's not too surprising. But when we do see a divergence, we tend to have the points up here or down here. And what that's implying is that alleles that increase flower size tend to be inflated in frequency in the large flowered population, whereas alleles that decrease flower size tend to decrease in the large flowered population size. All right, in other words, our pattern of effects within population is being mirrored by divergence among populations. And so this is a way we're trying to combine, uh, you know, kind of population sampling data, which again can be collected without any individual phenotypes just by sequencing entire populations in relation to more intensive individual based studies within populations. This is also parallel to kind of the work in humans where they've GWAS the hell out of height endlessly and then tried to relate differences between Northern and European and Southern European populations in height to allele frequency at height GWAS SNPs. Now I wanna look at populations through time. And I'm just gonna show you one of these analyses where instead of it being a natural contrast through time, we just took a large panel of, of individuals from this Iron Mountain population and imposed artificial selection on flower size. And after nine generations, we got substantial divergence in flower size from a common source population. There's nothing remotely surprising to getting a response to artificial selection. But in this kind of experiment, we can also immediately contrast by whole genome sequencing large numbers of individuals from the ancestral and derived populations or the large and small flower populations and look for SNPs in the population that responded to selection on flower size. And what we can see is a fairly good correspondence between the SNPs that we kind of were investigating in the field GWAS study that showed an effect on flower size and what happened in the experimental evolution study. Among 1,300 or so SNPs that 
showed a significant effect in the GWAS. We generally saw that the small fast alleles were much more common than the large slow alleles. And if you look at the change in minor allele frequency, it strongly parallels uh, what we got in the uh, selection experiment. In other words, the allele you would predict to increase in the selection experiment tended to do so in either the large or the small population. The other way we can do this is just look at the GWAS estimated effects on flower size and use them as a predictor of what should happen in the artificial selection experiment. And that was slightly less significant, but generally reassuring in terms of alleles that should increase flower size increased when we selected upward on flower size and decreased when we selected down. So to summarize the GWAS study, we had trade associated SNPs exhibit antagonistic pleiotropy along this kind of trade off axis that we've been studying previously. There was a kind of a, a tendency in allele frequency for the small and fast alleles to be more abundant in the population. And there was evidence of fluctuating selection. I've highlighted the two at the bottom because they address other questions, but they provide another thing which is kind of important, and that's corroboration. And in earlier in, in Juan's talk, he talked about the difficulties with GWAS studies identifying things or genomic studies identifying things, but not having kind of a, a second step. Well, if you discover one locus that's causal to fitness variation in nature, you have some obvious things to do. You can dive in on the gene. You might be able to do CRISPR to do substitutions or functional genomics. When you have 500 candidates, that's less attractive. And so you need to seek other ways to develop corroboration for a significant test. And these whole genome sequencing of population tests provide an independent data set, which you can attempt to corroborate tests that are specific to a particular field study. Now, the final thing I'd like to do to, to, to leave it with, and this goes to what Pascal was talking about in the overview for this section, you know, when we think about global change, a lot of people think about, you know, a, a consistent directional and gradual change in something like atmospheric CO2. But perhaps every bit as important are the effect of global change on temporal fluctuations, on the magnitude and frequency of changes in the direction of selection. I've listed here kind of a bunch of the field studies we've done over the last 20 years at this focal population. And the common feature of them is that in every single study in which we've done it at least two years, we see temporal changes in selection. In other words, the relative fitness of different genotypes, and there are different sorts of genotypes in all these studies, it changes from one year to the next. I honestly don't know if the magnitudes of fluctuations were larger or smaller than they were, say, 500 years ago, but they, they could be. And our approach moving forward to attempt to get a better handle on this is to try to develop predictions for allele frequency change from environmental drivers. Um, and we're obviously obsessing about water because this is a, a population in which everybody dies of drought. But if we can make that linkage, we, we tie it much more directly to the things people are thinking about in global change uh, research, which are often fluctuation in environmental variables, particularly the things we might eventually fit into a predictive framework. And with that, I'd like to, to thank you for your attention and acknowledge um, my various students, Ashley, Jack, uh, Julius, and Patrick, as well as Young Wah, and my more senior collaborators, John Willis and Leela Fishman, who contributed some of the stuff I didn't talk about, but to the long-term kind of data from Iron Mountain. And with that, if there's time, I'm happy to take any questions.